Welcome to Celebrity Interviews with Paul. Tonight, I am honored to have with me Eric Pritchett. Eric is actually a bona fide celebrity. He is, uh, he is on TV almost every night of the week. He is the, uh, the meteorologist for Channel 29, NBC 29 out of Charlottesville, Virginia. And uh, he is coming to us live on set. Isn't that awesome? Welcome to Celebrity Interviews, Eric. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So uh, you're going to give us a little tour of the set, I understand. Show us, uh, show us what's going on behind you there. Right. So I'm in the weather center here at the uh, studio, and I'll just uh, move the camera around a little bit. You can kind of see um, some of the uh, computers that are behind me. Of course, you're getting some uh, lighting off the uh, monitors there. But um, these are the different computers that, that we use here. And obviously, everybody wants to see where I actually present the weather. And Look at that. There we go. The that's big the green, green screen. screen. And, uh, the chroma and so key you, wall. The chroma key wall. And that's, and, you gotta be and, that, and that's where I stand in front of when I do the actual presentation that you see on the television set. So you ask, well, where is he pointing? What's he doing? Well, if you can look behind me here, you can see a television monitor, okay? Yep. So I can position myself and know where I need to point on my map. So I have a television monitor on my left side and on my right side, too. So you can see that behind me and see I'm yeah. pointing here. Yep. yep. Okay. Absolutely. And, and, and then and then I'm going to turn the camera around and you can see another television that's right in front of me. Yep. And above. Above that is the actual camera, and uh, to the left of that is the time clock. So it has my countdown for how many minutes I get to do my uh, weather presentation. Okay, so, so you can anyway. see, yeah, so you know when to wrap it up. Right, and so the uh, chroma key wall is basically uh, a simple way to say it. it's like having a hole, and you can put anything in the hole to make it look like you're wherever. So right. in front of graphics in front of a beach, out in space, wherever you want to be. <laughs> Magic of TV. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, um, tonight, of course, is August 26th as we're filming this, is recording, and it is Laura's night. Is, uh, is uh, the Hurricane Laura, is a big hurricane coming in? Is that, is that like, like Super Bowl for, uh, for weather people? Uh, sir, well, it's exciting. I mean, just the, the sheer dynamics of a, a hurricane. Unfortunately, you know, the the destruction and yeah. devastation that comes with it is not, but just to look at it on the satellite and radar picture is just incredible. It has gone through a massive uh, drop in pressure and strengthening within the last, well, within the last before, within the last 24 hours. And right. so it is a high, it's a high end category for hurricane. The seven o'clock advisory just came in from the national hurricane center and it's got winds now at 150 miles an hour. And of course, uh, that would be inundating uh, storm surge flooding. They're talking about 15 to 20 feet storm surge flooding in certain places along the Louisiana coast. Um, and that's well, just heard, incredible. I heard, I heard the governor saying it was unsurvivable, trying to get people away from yeah. the, away yeah, that, from that, it. That, that, is, that's, that, that's the wording to try to, to get people to act, and hopefully they've done that uh, because yeah, yeah. You, don't, you, you don't stand a chance of surviving something like that. And then, of course, you've got the destructive winds and... Of course, you've got the rain in and of itself, and uh, yeah, it was just horrible, horrible. Yeah. yeah. So we pray for all those people in the path of the storm, but uh, yeah, it was set to make landfall probably the pre-dawn hours of Thursday. But, okay. Yeah. Okay. Just right around the corner. Well, and that's one of them. Yeah. In Michigan, we get miserable weather, but we don't get destructive weather. Um, so <laughs> we're kind of blessed in that way. Um, we're cursed mm -hmm. in other ways with weather, but we're blessed because it's not as destructive like that. So, so you had a bachelor's in political science, and then now you end up, and for years, like more than a decade, you've been doing the weather. How, how do you go from a political science to being on TV doing the weather? I hear you. After college, I did some political campaign work, but uh, it just wasn't, it wasn't for me. But uh, long story short, back in uh, sixth grade, as I remember it, Paul, I had an interest for earth science. And, uh, of course, went to Mary Washington, as you say, a liberal arts college. It couldn't double major there, but I took a lot of geography classes and some environmental science classes. So anyway, um, I'd always had an interest in weather, but uh, I felt like, you know, the uh, chemistry and math and, and this type thing might limit me. 
Well, long story short is I found a program through Mississippi State University that uh, allowed me to pursue a geosciences concentration for television meteorologists. And this is something that I been interested in and I pursued it. And so it was a three-year uh, online course. And I also had already um, parlayed getting a, a position uh, for weekend meteorologist uh, here at the station. At that time, it was just advertised as a weekend weather anchor. And so um, my former chief um, gave me an opportunity. It basically, it was like a cattle call audition and I was narrowed down with a bunch of people that basically talked weather in front of the green screen there with some maps and um, I made the cut and I did that for almost a year and then they hired me part-time and then I worked myself into a full-time position and uh, continued to learn and um, have uh, uh, credentials uh, in terms of uh, organization um, steals through the National Weather um, Association and the American Meteorological Society. So I've worked awesome. my way up. Yeah, good for you. Well, what um, what is it like? You know, you're Charlottesville, not that big a place. I lived in, near Stanton, Virginia, for a while. Not a very big place. What's it like? You know, being a recognizable face in a fairly small community. Well, first of all, don't let it get to your head, which I don't. I, I'm not like that, <laughs> but. I remember, I remember the first time, I guess the best way to explain it is, um, you know, for people that don't know me, a lot of people in my hometown obviously know me because, you know, I grew up there and stuff, but, and of course, you know, high school uh, classmates, this type of thing, and my parents, friends, and, and, and of that nature, but um, I guess I was in a store one time, and um, I was doing my own thing, and I just looked up, and somebody was staring at me, and then I realized, okay, this is it, you know, they watch me on television and they're, they're seeing you outside of your place for the first time. Right. And so I automatically thought of the first time that I saw my teacher, like in grade school, outside sure. the classroom. And I was like, oh my gosh, like she's a real person, like she goes out. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's how I, that's how I seem to think people, you know, sometimes they think, you know, we're just stuck in the television and then right. when they see us out there, Oh, cool. Or, and you'll get comments like, I didn't know that you were that tall or, or this type thing, but most, most of the comments are nice. And, uh, sometimes you, uh, you get some, um, some weird comments, but, uh, for the most part, yeah. it's really nice. I always, I always thank people for watching. So anyway, always good to be gracious. That never hurts anything. Yes. Be humble. Be humble. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So how has, how has things changed over the last 10, 15, 20 years while you've been, while you've been in this, in this field? What's, what's evolved? What's oh, different? oh, a lot, a lot, Paul. I remember when I first started, we had dial up modem computers <laughs> and it would take forever for me to dial in and get my graphic packages that I would use on air. And um, radar, I would have to dial down as well. So sometimes my oh. radar image would be like 10 minutes old by the time I finished dialing it down from a from a mo phone modem for the computer. And uh, when I first started, there were a bunch of diafax printers everywhere, and we had a connection with the National Weather Service. So that's how we would get our information. And of course now, you know, we have everything off the internet. It's pretty quick, and and you can view it. And, you have many different sources to find sure. weather information on websites and this type of thing. And of course, just at the station, I mean, when I first started, we only had a, a couple of shows. And now, you know, we have longer shows, more shows. Uh, we have more weather hits, this type of thing. And so, yeah, that's changed a lot over the years. Yeah. And of course, yeah. now, now um, you've got the social media aspect. And uh, of course, a lot of people don't watch weather. They, they do watch weather, I should say. I, I, let me rephrase that. They don't watch at a certain time to get their news. And so you have on demand of when you want to see something or you go to your weather app or you go to the website and you can watch when you want to watch. Right. Um, so it's not like sitting there at five or six or 10 or 11 um, unless you want to. So yeah. you just have more options. You have more options to get the information when you want it. And of course our mobile society. Yeah. Well, and when we, just before we came on, you're like, that's great. I was just finishing my social media updates. 
because I guess that's part of the job yeah. description now too, right? You got to be that presence. And yeah, connect with people. So, you know, back back before back when I started, you know, that was non-existent. So uh, right. yeah, you push stuff out. You push stuff out on Facebook on our Facebook page, our our Twitter. And uh, then we have our website to maintain and we do updated videos there. And then we have a, a little segment on the weather nation and we have our little segment that we have to do um, recordings for. And so that sure. airs during the course of the night and I update that um, here in the evening. And I'll update it again before I leave tonight, my shift. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now um, what, uh, what do you love about what you do? What's, what's your, what, well, I've what always, brings you I've, I'll, I'll, I've always been fascinated with the weather, but it's just the idea that, you know, I get to actually talk weather, mm -hmm. study it, and get paid to do it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That works. That but works. Find, some, find something that you enjoy doing, and uh, it's, it, it, it makes it uh, a whole lot more just enjoyable. I, you know, weather's always changing. Everybody talks about it. Mark Twain says you can talk about the weather, but you can't do anything about it. And so, I mean, I literally get to uh, – <laughs> you know, analyze, study, and talk the weather. And I uh, try to make it as simple and understandable as possible and hopefully, uh, you know, inform folks of what they need to know. Now, of course, weather is incredibly complex and, and we're forecasting yeah. and we're predicting. We're not certain on these kind of things. Have you ever uh, gotten it really wrong and heard about it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's even worse. It's, it's even worse now with social media because everybody can chime in on their two two cent comments. You know what I mean? But, right. um, yeah, you know, it is a forecast and you're trying to hit a moving target and the atmosphere is just like the ocean. It's always in motion. And so even though we have gotten better in meteorology in terms of modeling and, and this type thing, it all goes back to the good information going into the computers because if it's bad information or it's incomplete information, you're not going to get a full picture. But now we've got the technology of the satellites, the better radar, all these things, the modeling, and it just makes the, it makes the uh, forecast prep a lot better than what it was years ago. Um, there's a lot of things that we don't know and we'll never know. But I think that, you know, three or four day out, uh, we're pretty good. And, uh, you know, we look at trends too, and obviously climatology based on, you know, this type of thing, but overall uh, forecasts have gotten good. And yes, yeah, sometimes there's a little surprise or something turn out the way that you, you thought it would based upon what you looked at, but you learn from it. And of course, where you live, your geography plays an important part of it too. But um, Absolutely. winter forecast, Absolutely. winter forecasting is probably the toughest because if I, if I tell viewers like, okay, it's going to rain tomorrow and we may get a quarter inch of rain, something like that. But if I go out and talk about a winter forecast and say, <laughs> you know, three to six inches of snow, then naturally people's ears perk up and it, it just, it feels like a fish tail because everybody picks the highest number and runs with it. I heard six inches. No, I heard, an, you know, whatever. <laughs> and so that can get, that can get frustrating, but that's how I feel. Um, right. You know, we give a range, and there's usually somebody that maybe exceed the range or be on the high end of the range or whatever. And sometimes we have to change the range. But anyway, it's bound to happen, and it does. But winter forecasting yep. by far is the most challenging. And of course, you throw in the different precip types and the changeovers sure. and this type of thing, and it makes it more complicated. Well, and winter's the one that we care about the most too. You know, <laughs> that's the one that that's the one that's going to change your travel plans and everything else. And uh, yeah, oh sure. Yeah. Sure. In, in Detroit, sure. we just see what, what's going on a few hundred miles west, and we dial it down a little bit, and that's how much snow we're going to get around here. It's just, uh, yeah. Of course, it our, our big snows, across. Of course, our big snows here come from nor'easters that uh, usually, you know, reorganize off, off the Gulf and then uh, hit the uh, Atlantic waters and the Gulf yep. Stream waters off the Atlantic and then kind of just explode, if you will, as they uh, move from the Carolina coast up toward New England. So that's where sure. we get our big snows, provided, provided we have the cold air in place. And yep. around here, we do get a lot of, around here, we do get a lot of freezing rain events, which is the yuck, what I call the yuck. <laughs> yeah. And that's really fun in a hilly, in a hilly environment around like, and Charles has got a lot of hills. Oh yeah. So, oh, yeah. Far so we're in the middle of a pandemic in the midst of all the rest of this stuff. Where, um, where do you find joy these days? Um, it's a good question, Paul, um, because 
we've been a little less mobile in terms of, you know, being able to go places and this type of thing, you know, any groups or, or this or this type of thing. Um, since about end of March, April, I've tried to go out and hike, um, get out in the woods, um, go to places in my own local and regional area that I had heard of or never had been before. Mm -hmm. um, most recently, I went up on the Blue Ridge uh, Mountains and uh, hiked a place called Spy Rock. I'd heard of it, never been, did the hike, and it was beautiful. <laughs> uh, I got to the top, and there were just a few people I saw on my way up. And basically, when I got to the top of the mountain, they were going down. So I had I had the uh, panoramic view of the valley and Central Virginia on top of the Blue Ridge for mm. at least 10, 15 minutes. That's and wonderful. so, yeah, I've That's learned gorgeous. I've learned to uh, I've learned to uh, enjoy what we have around us. And I think that's a greater appreciation because I think we go through life sometimes and everything's rush, rush, rush. And do you, you really stop to see, you know, what's out there? Um, and of course, I'm always amazed at the sunrise and the sunset, you know, God's mm -hmm. perfect plan for the day and the evening. And, uh, you know, we, our timing is never perfect, but his timing is always right. And, you know, you just get rhythm and, uh, you know, the beautiful sunrise and sunset, a, a greater appreciation. So that brings me joy too. There you go. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you for taking us on the set at uh, NBC 29 there in Charlottesville. And, uh, and thank you for, for sharing a little bit of your life and, uh, and your experiences with us. Thank you for being, being part of this. Paul, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to do it. And I certainly enjoyed running with you when we were in college. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was a privilege.